All you need is a little juju. All you need is a little juju. All you need is a little juju. All you need is all you need. Hey y'all, welcome to a little juju podcast. And we are doing our juju tube, aka YouTube interview today with Ade and Kwaku, who I'm so excited to be here. Um, I actually found out about you all through my friend Ahime. Ahime Ia, excuse me, Ia. And Ia had posted, um, I think it was something that Kwaku said, and I think it was a proverb, an African proverb, and I was like, oh, he's spitting. Let me follow. And then I found my day and I found that they were brothers. And I was like, oh, they both be spitting some real stuff on here. So I followed them and then that's then now we're here. Um, and it has been, it's such an honor because I think a lot of men reach out to me who do listen to the show. And my show is probably more centered on black women, but men have been like, hey, I like your show. You know, some guys doing something like, can you can you see where the brother's at? I'm like, all right, I, I am going to try to do that because I think it's important. So I think besides my godfather, y'all are the only guys I've had on an interview. So um, uh, it's super meaningful. So thank you and welcome. Yeah, thank, thank you for having you. us. Yeah, thank Definitely. you for having us. Yeah. It's an absolute pleasure. Cool, cool, cool. So tell me about yourselves. Who are you? What What is your name? What are your titles? What do you do? You go yeah. I, I'll let you go first. Go um, okay. So... My name is uh, Kweku Bekwing. Um, title, I guess, would be Okunfo. Um, and that basically is um, one of the types of priest in uh, Akan culture. Um, so I kind of, I grew up in that, um, but I recently completed my training, or at least the first part of my training. This is lifelong training. So so I completed the first part of my training, you know, recently. Um, and so, you know, that's, that's, that's a little intro to who I am. You know, I, I study... Uh, African wisdom, you know, a lot. I love it. Um, I use it on a daily basis to help just just guide myself, you know, through everything. Um, and yeah, I mean, you're going to learn more about me through, as we talk. So, so um, my name is Adetayo. Um, I guess technically you would call me an Olosha. Um, I initiated to Obatala um, in 2013 uh, in Abelkuta, Nigeria. It's been that long. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's been about seven years. Um, wow. Training to at some point uh, be a babalao um, at some point in life. So that's in the works. Um, yeah. Okay. So are you? Do you both practice in Orisha tradition and Akan or no? Technically, so, yeah. yeah. Um. So, so our father is Akan primarily, mm -hmm. um, and so we grew up Akan. So I've been initiated into that. Low key, we did initiate. I did initiation to the um, to the drums in Yoruba. Mm -hmm. So yeah, yeah, technically, I, I am initiated into Yoruba stuff as well. But he, you know, has done you know the the other parts of it. Um, but at some point, I'll go. I'm a child of Ogun, mm -hmm. and so at some point, I got to do that initiation <laughs> down the line. Mm -hmm. But you know, bit by bit. So mm -hmm. yeah, I was gonna say like um, I primarily practice Ifa, but because I grew up in an Akan household, right. I do both. I mean, in my household. My wife is also in a comfo. Mm -hmm. So we have a mixture of like right. Yoruba shrines, Akan shrines. Right. But I really don't see much of a separation. Yeah. You know, I just see it as different yeah. expressions of spirit. So it's not a hard line for me. Right. Okay. So I'm curious. You both said that you grew up Akan. So what does that mean? What does your, like, mm. walk us through a little bit of what your childhood looked like in that space? Mm. Wow. So that's a good question. Huh? Yeah. So, I mean, so amongst the Akan, so like the Yoruba will have like the bimbe, right? You come, you drum, you know, maybe Urisha will come down. For us, we call it Akon. And so that's one of the major things. Um, so growing up consistently, Akon, 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 with the the, the, the deities, the Busum, the Urisha were coming down. Um, and so engaging like that. And so, you know, just honestly from our names, at least me and some of my brothers, our names having Akan names going through Akan naming, you know, naming rituals, um, following the traditional Akan calendar. Like we have a 42 day month and we have that cycle we follow and there's certain rituals we do on certain days. Um, like I said, my dad's a priest. And so certain times we go, we have to feed our shrines. We have to do this work. Um, even like the Akan new year, typically will more so fall around like September. Mm -hmm. Right. And so there's a big festival we celebrate at that time. We call it Ojira which is like a cleansing festival, right? And so there's a number of different festivals that we have um, 
for different purposes. And so kind of throughout just growing up, just participating and engaging in these, in these various things, um, you know, learning, learning Akan language, the Akan language, learning the songs, the, the drumming, um, just various parts of it, you know, it was just kind of integrated into a lot of stuff we did. Yeah, and I, I guess the point I would just add is that I think the philosophy of not seeing a separation between these cultures, I think came from my parents because while he, I think my parents always knew that he was on the track to being a Okonfo, but for me, like when I was born, um, and this is before my father became a priest in Akan, this is back when he was living in New York, he went to a Babalao um, to get my name, to do a traditional uh, Essentai naming ceremony. So they gave me a long Yoruba name and they would send me to do Yoruba stuff. Like I was when I was 18, they sent me to a Babalao and they were like, yo, you got to get this divination done. Yeah. At the time, I didn't want to hear none of that. Like they were like, <laughs> you got to cut know. your hair at some point. <laughs> I had just... My locks had just got long. I was feeling myself. I'm like, man, I ain't trying to cut my hair. But all that to say that they never yeah. saw the separation. They kind of pushed us in different directions. Okay. That's amazing. So there really wasn't a moment where, I mean, just talking to a lot of people now, they transition from a tradition to another, or maybe we're mm -hmm. practicing something more Abrahamic, and then they're actually just trying to figure it out now. You all actually were born into um, African traditional Tr religions and understanding so there was so you're saying there was actually no transition from something like that yeah no, i was generational That's yeah I, I, yeah I, it's, it's okay. exactly it like our parents and and on one side our grandparents did that work so they were the ones who oh. so at first they went from christianity to islam and then it was like okay well from islam you know how, what's the, the what's the next step that we have to take um and so our parents took that step like my dad grew up yeah. in the church I think he was an altar boy and everything. But I think when he got to college and a little bit after that, after he married my mom, they began to see, okay, well, what's the, the things that we need to be, what's the next step we need to take? Yeah, I was about to say, like, my dad's from Haiti. So, you know, most Caribbeans, very, like, Christianity is very, very entrenched. So he yeah. grew up very deep in that. Mm -hmm. But there's some, like, aunts and great aunts from Haiti right. who have, uh, will do names um, right. like as an aunt that has Azuli in her name. Yeah. And so there's hints that like, OK, she practiced. But like he said, you know, it was a transition. At first, my grandparents weren't exactly the most welcoming to it. Like when my, when my, when my father came home, like, yo, we're doing this African thing. Yeah, also with vegetarian. And so, you know, <laughs> that's not exactly Haitian culture either. So at first they were like, eh. and on the other side, like he said, they come from the deep south. My mother's family right. come from the deep south. And so when my grandmother was like, she met my grandfather. She was. Well, she was selling beauty products, right? Like hair straightening stuff, door to door. She met my grandfather. He started kicking some consciousness, and she was like, "Wait a minute!" So she kind of left all of that deep church, deep uh, southern stuff. They moved to New York and started getting into Islam. So, gen generational work. Okay, I see. I see. Wow, that's very fascinating. Um, I could keep talking about that, but I'm like, I got other questions. We got a lot. Okay, so I do want to talk about a con culture because no one else that I've interviewed has. No, yeah, no, no. So y'all will be the first. So can you just tell me a little bit about what the cosmology looks like? So first, I would like to give a little history, right, <laughs> first. So when it comes to icon culture here in America, um, just as a lot for African-Americans here um, with Yoruba culture, a lot of it's traced back to Oyotunji village um with uh Baba um Osage Osage Osage, Osage, right? Osage, the first, yeah. right and so he kind of was at least for African Americans seen as like the godfather of of Yoruba culture right and so for our Khan people his actually his friend and contemporary is Nana Yao Apari Dulu the first um and he it was the person who basically returned our Khan culture over here he went to Ghana he had a, 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 um, a drum and dance ensemble. He took like a whole bunch of people, like 200 people to Ghana. When he got there, I think he was meeting with um, uh, the president, Kwame Nkrumah, at the time. Somehow he got connected with a priestess over there, Anna Akriya Parabia. And basically it was through divination that it came up that he was a descendant of her family lineage and that he was he had returned to bring back the shrines to Africans in America. And so there he brought back the shrine, Nana Sui JB, Nana Adade Kofi, Nana AC, and I think Nana Tigre, I can't remember. Um, but from there, kind of the Akan culture began to pro proliferate throughout um, uh, America. So basically, anyone who does Akan culture, whether directly or indirectly, can be traced to um, 
I know y'all inside of America, inside of America, in, in, in America. Um, and so in terms of cosmology, icon culture primarily is built on duality between the physical and the spiritual. And that's pretty much all African culture. Yeah. But that's very, very you know important in recognizing that while we're very physical, we do have a spiritual component. And so for the human, a, a, a person, there are three, maybe four primary parts that are recognized. You have the moja, which is considered the blood. You have the um, the sunsun, which is considered like the spirit. And then you have the okra, which is the, the soul. The okra is said to come from Onyame, who is the creator, it's Olodumare, right? Um, then you have the sunsun. Some people say the sunsun, the spirit comes from the father's side. And then the moja comes from the mother's side. And so you can see it's Onyame, the mother, the father, and they, the, the, the three of them coming together represents creation and, 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 and everything. And right. And so that balance is, is extremely necessary. And basically like in anything that we do, we give recognition to Onyami because we recognize that we come and go, you know, from Onyami. Um, yes. So it's that. a little bit, cause you explained this to me cause I can't coach a little bit more his specialty, but you explained to me how it's actually a little bit different than things are here in the sense that Akan culture is traditionally matriarchal. So, right. so in that breakdown that he gave, your blood coming from your mother. Mm -hmm. So like, I believe property and other things yep. all come through your mother's line. And the right. idea is that your mother's family, I don't want to say your father's family, not your family, but your mother's family is where your blood comes from. So it's... Yeah, so like you'll even like your uncle, your mother's brother, right? Those are the ones who will be considered your uncles, Got it. right? And they are a lot of times have a very, very big influence on what happens in your life. That doesn't mean your father, you know, side doesn't, but there's a special role that the father's side plays. Mm -hmm. So the father's side, while the mother's side is called the Ebusia, which is the family, the father's side is called either the intro or the intone. And that's, some people say the matric clan, the mother's side, and the patrick clan, the father's side. And so the patrick clan has a very special role in like the spiritual and the character development of the child, right? And so the father's side will have and this is very, very traditional. The father's side will have a particular bosom that represents all the people connected to that father's side. And that that deity, that bosom will watch over all of the children who are attached to it. And so it's very important. They, they say, like, if you don't know your father, you're kind of missing out on that protection mm -hmm. because you don't know. Because there's rituals that you will go and do, you know, to make sure that your soul is being cleansed and you're being protected in this way. The mother's side, it has its role. You know, and so kind of just recognizing these various balances to make sure as we move through life, things are being taken care of appropriately. Yeah. yeah. So I think I mean that's a little that's a little bit. Um, there are some books if you want to read more on it. Um, can I can I just add oh, something ahead, to that too? But but very similar to uh, like Ifa Orisha culture, mm -hmm. like there's the creator, there's uh, Onyame or right. um, different names that the creator is known by. There are different uh, deities, like you said, called Bosum, very similar to Orisha. Mm -hmm. um, there's ancestor work that's done. Right, exactly. I mean, we have some different concepts like Egg Bear Rune and right, Ori right. and stuff like that are not exactly present, but a lot, similar of stuff, structure. a lot of stuff ends up being the same. Okay. You know, you, you have the divinate, you have your divination systems, mm -hmm. you have your way of going and asking those questions, right? You have when the, the, the Bosum, the Orisha come down, you have what happens there. Um, so for us, we have, you know, what you would call Okonfo, and that's a person who specifically trains to allow the Bosun, the deity, to come and sit on them, mm -hmm. right? So they're possessing them, they're doing work, and, and so on. And you also have people who are like Odunsini, which are like the herbalists. So they know the herbs, and they... Yeah. It's like, it's like, with it. yeah, those are like, would be similar to what we call Baba Losha, Ia Losha. Exactly. Or uh, um, or Losayan, like Peace of Losayan, exactly. they work with herbs and stuff. Yeah. Right, and so it, it, it goes out. Can you say, say that again? Who might not know what Losayan and Baba Losha, can you say what that is? Yeah, Baba Losha is like, um, uh, basically a, a, a male priest of uh, any particular Orisha. Mm -hmm. So like, that's just, so that's, I use that term because like, that's one that's like, in Nigeria and you say that in Cuba, Baba Losha, Ia Losha. Ia Losha would just be the female priest of Orisha. And, but Osayan is like a particular Orisha that deals heavily with herbs, herbs. and plants and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. So the Osayan people, they know about a lot of, mm -hmm. a lot of different herbs, which is the equivalent of yeah. the, yeah. was it Odinsini that he said? Yeah, the Odinsini. And that, that literally it translates as something like de dealing with a piece of a tree. 
And so it's, it's very, very connected, you know, yeah. to, to the forest and so on. So, right. yeah, that does sound very um, similar to Orisha tradition. I guess I'm wondering, and I don't even know how to ask this question, but what does that look like in 2020 practice mm -hmm. for you all um, practicing ancient traditions, you know, as Black men now? What, is, mm -hmm. what does that look like day to day for you all? Ooh, that's a... Yeah, that's a that's, question. That's, that's a heavy question. Yeah, yeah. These, these are the important questions. I mean, these are things that we discuss every day. It's it's hard in some ways because. So I'm trying to. I, I always like to like give some framing points, but like, I really think there's not that much of a separation between what's spirit and what's culture. And so, like, if you take a con culture, you're about culture. It's very integrated into a certain lifestyle, man. You know, like people don't spend twenty four seven inside a concrete traditionally. You know what I'm saying? And you, if, if, if you live it off the land and you're disconnected in a certain way, sometimes it can become difficult to, to replicate that, you know, um, here. Like something like you got to, you got to, you on your computer all the time. You got to go to work. You got to do all this stuff. Like, okay, how do I make sure I do my right. four day Orisha calendar and I'm <laughs> yeah. going to see my Orisha at the right time? It's difficult. Also, something that's actively frustrating to me is like, the way people study traditionally back home, man, like, yeah. you know, one of my um, uh, Uluos in Nigeria, one of my teachers in Nigeria, like, he lived with his teacher for 11 years. Like, he, he studied a lot at home. He's a babalao. He studied a lot at home. Then he, then, when he, then he went and lived with his teacher for 11 years and studied with him. Then he went and traveled and studied. And so, like, for me, it's like, yo, I want to get to that level of expertise, right. but, like, how do I do that mm -hmm. being over here? So, I don't, so all I have to say, I don't have all the answers, you know, so it's a, it's, it's a give it's, and take. You it, do what you can. Right. It's, I mean, definitely the a different environment will cause you to find different ways of doing certain mm -hmm. things. But for me, I think one of the major things that we have to do, we talked about the herbs. So making sure that you grow your herbs. And as you go through that process, going from seed, you know, to, to plant that you can use the fruit and it's reproducing, you begin to see things and connect. Yeah. Right. Like, so we just, we just got some plants um, in Europe, they call it Eudo. Um, bitter leaf or um, how do you call it? An icon? It's like I want you know, but that's that's a herb that can be a lot of it's eaten in West Africa, and that's just it's one of them super herbs. Honestly, mm -hmm. you know, it can be used for a lot of stuff. But I also have other plants that I'm growing that I use in my shrine work, right? And so by growing it, that allows us to connect, right? Um, and just honestly trying to be as connected to what we call asasia, the earth, as much as possible. So if you have the time. And you got like a, a state park next to him by your in your neighborhood trying to go to the park and just just walk around, you know, learn the plants that are there, you know. Um, but yeah. also, I think these traditions have. So we're very used to the, the Gregorian calendar. And that is kind of the, the way we shape time. It's like, OK, we do this on this time. So what is the traditional calendar of your system that you practice? So the Akan, we have our 42, we have like nine 42 day cycles that make up a year for us. And we have certain days in that cycle. We have what we call Dabone, which is like a, a holy day, right? And so that's a day you do particular shrine with either for your ancestors or for your shrines or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so making sure you follow that, finding that out, following it so that, you know, you're not just existing in kind of this Western format of, of time, right? But you're existing within side of, your own culturally relevant uh, a format of, of time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm about to say like today, I know we got the like the four day cycle and then I believe it's 16 or 17 days. But like, I mean, you, you know, being in the tradition, like you're supposed to visit certain shrines on certain days. And today, you know, it's a day to visit Abatala or Orishanla. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's hard to do that. It's, it, it's it, you know, it's hard to, with, with the, the see of everything else is going on. But something that one of my teachers told me, like, kind of checked me a little bit because he was like, yo, yo, you've been on your stuff. And I was like, I've been slipping a little bit. This was years ago. He was like, look, you got to remember that this is the center of, of, of your life and everything else is and not that it doesn't matter, but it's an extension of that. So like you go, the shrines are giving you the other stuff, not the other way around. You're mm -hmm. not, the other stuff, not the center. And then you kind of sprinkle right. the shrines on the other side, you know, mm -hmm. so that me in place yeah it just calls you to flip right. everything yeah yeah <laughs> i mean i know you you do i mean is it you know is it ever a challenge for you like i know i've seen you posting your stories like you have been growing some stuff maybe oh yeah you know? kind of stuff um that, i think that's what grounds me and it's funny y'all talking about this and going to the land and going to the park because i pulled a card today Ooh, hold on because i might have to grab it because I, <laughs> I just it's just so in alignment and i don't want to say it 
incorrectly, but yeah, Quaku could probably say it. But this is the card that I pulled today. Ah, uh, so I see it drew. Yeah, the earth has weight. Yep. Mm-hmm. Right. And so I was reading about Asase Yedru and mm-hmm. what it means to just taking care of the land and being in connection to Mother Earth and all. And I don't know, is this a deity within a contradiction? So that's an adink- a, a dinker symbol, right. right? And so the Akan have a system of writing that express certain ideas. And so that would be, so As- Asasiya is, it could be seen as a deity, but that literally is like Mother Earth, right? Mm-hmm. So As- Asasi is Earth and Yah represents that, at least for certain Akan people, she was born on a Thursday, right? So each day you have a particular name. So like Kweku, I was born on a Wednesday. Yah or Yao is Thursday, right? So that's what that's representing. Mm. Yeah. Okay, and so like, I mean, in, in Akan culture, like there's the reverence and connection to the land, right? To these natural sources is paramount. Like there's a, uh, my favorite proverb, it's actually a riddle, it's played on the drums. It says, It's so child, quine, or quine child, it's so, or pain wine. So basically it's saying the road crosses the river, the river crosses the road, which is the eldest. And it repeats that. And then it said, um, we created the road to go and, and encounter the river. The river is from ancient. The river is from Odumakuma, the one who is like bountiful, the one who created all things. And so it's re- giving recognition. It's like the Esul, the river was there before anything else. The road was created by either us or some other thing coming and creating it. But the river, that's the thing that was from ancient, it's from the beginning of creation. Mm-hmm. And so when we come and engage with it, we have to give the appropriate respect to it. I mean, you can see with all the pollution and, and things like that is happening, there's an imbalance that is occurring right now. Did you say something he mentioned to me, which I thought was interesting, was like, traditionally, you don't do certain work to yep. to disturb the earth on a Thursday because... yeah. The, the earth was born on a Thursday, you yeah. know, and then like even growing up in an icon household, you know, back to the question, like, I remember like whenever we want to cut down a tree or do anything to like take a branch from a tree, take some leaves, we'd have to offer an egg, maybe say a prayer, do something like that, but some sort of offering to that tree. So I think it's very rooted in icon culture. Yeah. Yeah. And even just a lot of African or diasporic traditions too, because they're like in hoodoo, I'm leaving some pennies. If I take something out the ground, I got exactly. Leave. Exactly. Yeah. Mm. That's powerful. Okay, so you did mention Proverbs, so I do want to transition a little bit into that because um, that's how I found you all. You all were reciting Proverbs. You have little proverb battles. We go <laughs> back and forth, and they're not just the con. They're just different African uh, Proverbs. So how did that start? And um, I know you call it words from yesterday at your Instagram where you posted different Proverbs, but where did that idea come from? Why did you think it was important to do that? Mm. Man, so I think Proverbs have just always been a part of our upbringing. So I, I, it's like three distinct stages, I guess, that I remember. I remember just like being in the household, like, you know, um, cause we grew up here, you know, um, black American households, Proverbs are very big, right? You all kind of stuff, you know, uh, hard head makes a soft behind, you know, I posted right. one other day, God don't like ugly, you know, all, all, all these things. So we grew up with those being said to us all the time. Um, then when we went to school, we went to this African centered school. Our teachers would write Proverbs in the board every day. We'd have to discuss them. And then I think when we went through, like in our community, we go through this rite of passage, manhood training processes they have for men and women. When we turn 14, that's when you really got to dive into it. And that one, we had to memorize hundreds of Proverbs. Like that was a part of our uh, graduation process. And throughout it, you know, you're getting like, uh, you're being put under pressure, yeah. you know, under pressure. You're like, you know, you got to re- recite your 10 Proverbs. Here's a topic. You got to say it. And so I think uh, a few years ago, we, because we've been helping out with that program maybe for the last 15 years, they were like, okay, we need y'all to teach Proverbs. And so we're spending years teaching these kids Proverbs and going over with the boys. We're seeing how much they love it. And then I think for us, the moment came in like, you know what, these Proverbs are so useful for us. Like, why don't we just share it? You know? And so we were like, let's, let's, let's try to find a medium to do that. And so that's where, you know, words from yesterday came in. But all that to say, like the foundation is like, it's extremely useful for us. Even if I wasn't doing words from yesterday, I'd be reciting these proverbs every yeah. morning, yeah. you know, yeah. and they yeah. come to me. So yeah, yeah. Did you want to add anything quickly? Or was um, I mean, for African, like African culture, whether on the continent or in, in the diaspora, it, it it revolves around words because we recognize how words have power, mm-hmm. right? And so 
Proverbs kind of is our way to encapsulate wisdom. And so it's a literally anytime you say Proverbs, you're transferring wisdom from one person to another. Mm-hmm. You're, you're speaking wisdom out into the world. And so like a lot of cultures, like if you come and you start misusing Proverbs, people will look at you traditionally, like you may have been, there may have been some actual repercussions, but people will look at you like you're misusing your words. Mm-hmm. Like, why are you just, just saying anything? Like, there's a proverb, words are like eggs and they drop, they shatter, right? And so if, you, if you're if you being useless, when they drop and they go everywhere, they go to this place and that place, there's going to be things that occur. And so you have to be very specific about what you're saying, how you say it, when you mm-hmm. say it, and all those various things. Mm-hmm. Even, man, even a, a pretty cool story, like just seeing how the proverbs are played on the drums and how seriously people take it. One story comes to my one of my brothers uh, who yeah. <laughs> had just got back from Nigeria. He had been studying traditional bata uh, in Nigeria for a summer or whatever. And one of our professors at Howard, he was an old Yoruba gentleman, and he was like, "So, he, so, so our friends teach us the proverb, and what's the proverb? Awalagba, awalagba, adie fufulagba, adie." Yeah. So he's teaching us how to play, and he's like, "The professor walks up, he's like, watch this. I'm gonna play a proverb. All he plays is the first part on the drum, dun 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 dun, and the professor repeats the rest of it back." Just because yeah. he he came up, I guess, in the old times where Proverbs was so big that all he had to do was just hear the sound, you know. So I think that speaks to how ingrained it is in the culture. Wow, that's powerful. I'm curious if y'all could say um, two Proverbs each, some of y'all, your favorite ones. Yeah, <sighs> you want to go first? Ah, uh, <laughs> John put me on the spot first. <laughs> it's okay, it's okay. cool. One of my, I think one of my favorite Proverbs is, um, it's an icon one, and it says, and it says the elephant is big, but the nation is owned by Adua. And it's like either antelope or another type of animal like that. And basically that proverb speaks to the fact that while there may be things that are very majestic, you know, the like the it's more so the quality, the character of a particular thing that determines its ability. So it's not always the physical might that is the most important thing, but some of the internal qualities. Um mm-hmm. And the other one is, hopefully I say this right, is it's another icon problem. It says, And and it says that it is the bird of the forest that does not know rice is an edible grain, but not the bird of the grassland. And this one basically says, if you from a particular place, you know the rules, the the regulation, what you should and shouldn't do. But if you're coming from somewhere else, you're not you're not going to know. Right. And so to me, that kind of speaks as like if you're from somewhere, you know what you're supposed to do. So do that. Do it well. Do it correctly. Mm-hmm. Now, if you're coming from another place, we, we recognize there may be some things you don't know. But at a certain point, you have to learn that thing, too. Right. right? So that's that's to me, two of my favorite proverbs that I say a lot to myself. So mm, Those are powerful ones. Okay, I got to follow that up. Um, <laughs> <proverb> bad, <laughs> <laughs> Let me see. Uh, so I'm still learning my Yoruba, so I ain't gonna be able to say it as good as he did, uh, but in English, it, the, the, the main part of the proverb says, Suru ni babaywa, which is basically uh, uh, patience is the father of character. But I think the, the whole proverb says anger accomplishes nothing, patience is the father of character, an elder who has patience has all things, I and said. that comes from the Odu uh, Ogbeonu. Um, but that one, I love that one so much because one of my birth names means patience, Sabor. Um, but there's a story that goes with that one. It's a little bit too long to tell. But essentially, uh, in this story, um, Arumila does a favor for the vulture, I think. And then the vulture goes and tells the creator, Olodumare. Olodumare is like, I present Arumila with three gifts. And so he presents him with uh, patience, long life, wealth, and the blessings of children. So he has them all in these gourds, right? And he's like, Arumila, you can only pick one. Um, and I'm going to take the rest back with me. And so Arumila goes back and forth for a long time. Everybody tells him different things. His, he has two wives. They, they tell him to pick, like, no, nah, pick long life, pick uh, mm-hmm. blessings of children, pick wealth or whatever. So he goes, he consults, he finds, he finds like pick patience. So he picks patience. The rest of them go back to heaven. And then slowly they start to miss their friend patience. So slowly long life starts to be like, man, I miss my friend. Oludumari, God, can I please go out and be with my friend patience? So long life goes down. Or maybe I has both of those. Then uh, wealth goes down. So long story short, that's one of the stories that explains why if you first choose patience, you'll have all things. So for me, that's always a reminder, like, look, do the work that you got to do. It's not saying just sit idly, but right. you, 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 you got to have patience. Things take time. Um, 
So that, that, that one, not to go too much into that, but that's one of my absolute favorite ones. Let me see another one. Um, ooh, okay, this is an Igbo proverb. This one says, if a medicine man is not careful uh, when looking up in the sky, he'll fall into a pit below. And so that one, I love that one because it kind of grounds me. It reminds me that like, look, because what are medicine men concerned about? Medicine men, medicine women, they're concerned about divine occurrences. They're concerned about spirit. And so it's kind of saying like, if you're just, if that's the only avenue in which you're concerned with and you pursue things, then you may run into some issues, right? So it reminds me that, yeah, say my prayers, do my shrine work, but then I got to actually like, I got to use my own wisdom, my own eyes. I got to deal with what's practical. I got to use my hands, Ooh. my feet, everything. So that's- Child, that's first of all, don't be reading now. Don't be reading <laughs> This is an interview. You're right. <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> um, that's beautiful. That's it's so beautiful. Um, so you told me yeah. that you all teach young boys these proverbs currently, mm -hmm. like this that's work that you all do. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's a, a process that you all went through when you were younger as well. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yes. Yes, yes. What do you all think is important about these um initiatory processes for young men, for young black men? Like what what do you feel like it does that may be lacking for a lot of um, a lot of black men? So I think one of the important things when you look at initiation, it you're you're being initiated one into kind of a group of a set of knowledge, right? But more importantly, you're being initiated into a, like a circle of accountability. Right, because the people who trained me, the people who taught me what I know, I'm accountable to them. They can come to me and tell me, Kweku, you are not doing what you're supposed to do. You know how you were trained and taught. And so they, they can reprimand me and I have to listen. They're my, what we call, nana -nom. they're my teachers, they're my elders and so on. And so I'm I'm accountable to them. Some of them are by my uh, the people I've trained with. I'm, I'm accountable to them as well. The people who trained me, whether it be my father, other you know, men and women in the community who have trained me, I'm accountable to them. For the rite of passage process, we're accountable to a group of men for us to, they can come to us and be like, uh, you are not doing what you are supposed to do, mm -hmm. right? If, Sab if Sabor messes up, I know you won't mess up ever, but if Sabor messes up in his marriage or anything like that, the men can come to him and be like, yo, what are you doing, mm -hmm. right? And we're all, we also have, because of this, because everything is balanced, we have a group of women that we can go to and that we're held accountable to as well. And so there's balance in what we do. Um, and so to me, the knowledge, yeah, you get that, you know, all the skill sets, yes. But to me, one of the most important things is the circle of accountability that you're initiated into. Mm, that's a powerful point. Yeah, yeah. Accountability is definitely something that's lacking in some spaces. Like some communities I've gone to, like, you know, just in, in, in dating and meeting people's families, you know, just growing up, like, there's some families I've gone to where like the men meet all the time and they have those circles of accountability and they will check each other. But I think by and large, that's something that could be missing. So I, I absolutely agree. The accountability needs to be there. Um, but then also I think that like traditionally in a lot of cultures, and this is not just African cultures, manhood and womanhood is not an, ac an accidental thing, right? So I think that in America, we kind of live in a cultural melting pot. So we don't exactly live under the banner of one particular culture, you know, and that has its pros and cons. But if you go to a society that has a particular, a particular culture and set of standards, what it means to be a man, there's a specific like definition in terms of what it entails, right? So it's like, if it's like, yo, as a man, your responsibility is to be a protector. As a man, your responsibility is to, I can't think of anything random. Like you build the drums, you cut down the trees, you plow the farm, whatever your responsibility is, those societies have to have processes to take boys into that role of what manhood is. And so I'm not saying that everybody has to fall into one in this community, but I think that there should be some tenets and some standards. Right. So if it's like, yo, as a man, you have to protect the people in the community, or as a man, you represent discipline, you represent patience, you know? So you, you, you may see a lot of young boys who don't necessarily, are not necessarily in control of their emotions. You know, we as black people, we have a lot of trauma. So you may see a lot of young boys experiencing these strong emotions associated with trauma. And sometimes those emotions and that rage can hurt the people around them. You know, so I think that that process that socializes them into these standards for what a man is, 
is very important mm -hmm. in addition to that accountability. Mm -hmm. I'm curious as to what you all think that manhood is based in your respective traditions. How would you define mm. manhood for yourselves? I mean, for me, the, the, the primary thing I would say, I would say manhood is balance. Like, mm. like, yeah, for me, like that's that's how I'm taught. It's just it's balance. You can't you can't be too much of this, too much of that. It's a it's a it's a balance as you move through things. And so when you look at it as balance, when you come to a situation, you can figure out what you need to do, how you need to move, because you look, okay, what's the balance here that I need to find? So you get into a relationship. It's not just, oh, I'm, I'm the one who needs to do this, that, and the third, everything. It's no, what's the balance that occurs here? How do I find that balance? You still make sure you protect and you, you know, establish a perimeter or whatever. But the more important thing is what is the balance that's occurring here? And how do I ensure that this follows through, you know, different uh, challenges that we'll meet and so on. So to me, it's, it's, it, the, the foundational tenet is balance. Mm -hmm. I mean, the only thing I would add to that is that I think that it's changed depending on what stage I'm in in life. So I think that growing up as a child when I wasn't out of the house too much, it just meant being responsible around the house. It meant being a good brother, being my brother's keeper, being someone they can lean on. As I started to get to high school, I don't have the responsibilities of being a family man and the rest of that stuff. But it's, yo, can my brothers and my sisters call on me, right? Can, can my sisters trust me to look out for them in basic ways? Like maybe just walking someone home. Can my brothers call me when they need emotional support? They about to get into a fight. Can they call me? You know, and I think when, you know, when you start dating, it means something different. You know what I'm saying? It means giving a different level of support to people. I think a key point is being a pillar. And so I think when I move into being a father, you know, and being a family man and stuff like that, like it means being a pillar within my household, you know, being someone, this is my definition, like creating a space, creating a safe space, you know, where your lady, your children can just thrive and just survive. And to me, that's just a beautiful thing. Like sometimes just be able to sit back and like, yo, like, you know what I'm saying? I, I've like, this is a space where, where, where like, cause you know, like, like women just create and multiply and, you know, when, when they're able to do the things that they can do, it's just so beautiful, you know? And so like, for me, I feel like part of my role is being able to establish that safe space where they can just create it, just be beautiful and just do everything that's, you know, that's just dope, you know? And so for me, I think, again, it's just like pillar, you know, like all, always being a pillar. I think the balance is important too. Like, I think it's like, uh, I mentioned this before in something I posted, but like, as a man, use a certain fire that you have. Men and women have that fire. I think men and women both have masculine and feminine energy. But I think there's a certain fire that, that, that you have that if it goes unchecked, you know, you, you can become uh, abusive or you can become overly aggressive to your brothers. But I think it's maintaining that balance, like understanding the power of that fire, that Sean right. energy. Like, no, I don't need to be ruled by that all the time, you right. know, but it, it, it plays an important role. You know, I also can be a healer when I need to be a healer. So, right. yeah. How do you see, what is my question? What could that look like for people now who may not be connected to a religion or tradition? Mm. Are examples of how they could kind of access that same energy or process in their communities? Mm. I think it, it, it has to start with what he said, like, there has to be systems of accountability. So I think that groups of men yeah, right. can link together, you know, and establish like, yeah, this, this is the set of standards that we follow. This is what it means to be a man. Like if, 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 if being a man means that you, you're diligent, you work hard, if it means that you never abuse your sisters, if it means that you were, you study and wisdom is important to you, whatever those standards look like, get a group of men together and establish those standards. Right. And then I think that, uh, hold each other to those standards, you know, and then just continue to grow your circle. And as, as boys come up within that, you can socialize them exactly. into that, into that system of manhood. Yeah. No, I mean, that's, that, that, that's exactly what I was going to say. You know, to me, that's the best process. Like, I mean, our rite of passage in, in community that we went in, that's how it was started. Like it started in DC, you know, because it was like during the crack, crack epidemic. A lot of a lot of black boys were being taken away from the various things that were happening. And so they're like, yo, we got to do something. Mm -hmm. So a couple of men got together. They started the Rite of Passage program. The next year, the women got together. They started their Rite of Passage program and they, mm -hmm. together, of course. But it's through that thing, being intentional about what you're trying to do, laying out the foundation and then building on top of that. Can I can I add a point to yeah. that? I think uh, America as a society 
if there's no neutrality, like culturally, like if you're not tra- if you're not training your, your 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 boy, your nephews, your sons, or whatever, if you're not socializing them into your definition of manhood, somebody's socializing them. And so the images that you see of constant negative images of black men who are just overly aggressive, who are just like always just uh, attacking each other, who are abusive to women, who are whatever. Those are the, the, the what's on the music, what's dominating the music. Like I shoot niggas, I kill. Like that's that's what's gonna raise your 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 children. Right, you know. So right. I think that you you can't delude yourself to think that you can just let whatever happen and somebody's voice or somebody's agenda is not filtering into mm-hmm. you know your um, the socialization yeah. process that happens for the young boys in your life. Exactly. Whew. Y'all may have answered this, but I'm I'm curious of how whether the rites of passage ceremony or your or the traditions that you practice, how have they aided in your healing um, mm. and your confidence? Mm. So for me, like I mean, I can, some stuff I, we can't talk about, but there there are challenges you have to face. There are tests you have to face, and so for me, in terms of my confidence, once I've gotten through that. Any other challenge that comes at me in life, I'm like, look, I went through this. <laughs> I can face this. You know, I can face it. I know I got people behind me who are going to stand by me and protect me and, and push me forward in the best manner. And so that right there, having the group of men and women who are who are surrounding you, having that community that uplifts you, it gives you, you know, the most confidence in the world. You know, um, but I think going through the process, I think it, it, it kind of introduced me to certain foundational things. But to me, a lot of the, the the learning and growing happened when I came back and was working with the boys because mm-hmm. it's in that process of me now having to figure out how do I teach someone else this? Because it makes now you face that that question yourself, okay, what is this thing? And so all these various, the tenets of, of manhood and, and, and this, that, and the third, you have to sit now and say, okay, what does this mean? What does it mean to be balanced? And so you have to face your imbalances in your own life and figure out, okay, how do I achieve this balance so that I can be some, someone, a represent, a representation of this to these younger boys who are coming up, you know? So for me, I I would say those, those type of things. Yeah. I mean, for some reason, there's certain moments that I remember, you know, it's been like 16 years now, certain moments I remember certain conversations that happen. And so, you know, there's some elders, I'm going to mention them, uh, Baba Ajay Koto, uh, Baba Tiba that, that like have, just said certain things in my ear that I remember. And so like, like I remember, I remember uh, an elder Baba Ajay, he saying when I was 14, for some reason, we were doing like an anatomy class or whatever, and like a um, sexual education class or whatever. And he was just like giving me advice about how to help my wife when she's pregnant. Like he was like, when your wife is pregnant, like you might have to do this, this, and this. And I don't know if he could like see the future, but like who would think to tell a 14 year old boy that? But some of those things that he said to me, when I actually had to like t- try to be a support system to a pregnant woman, I was like, oh, shit, this is, <laughs> this is what he said to me. And then like one more proverb that's, that's always said all the time is like the wise man takes the bitter medicine. That's that, that's that's one that's just like Damn, even to this day, it's like, yo, like most of the things that will help you grow the most in life is they're going to be bitter and it's going to involve <laughs> you voluntarily taking the bitter medicine and exposing yourself to that. And if you. If you shy away from the bitter of life, you know, you, you're, you're never going to grow and you're doing yourself a disservice. So even now, like with the COVID thing, just trying to still be a provider through COVID, even though some business stuff has been messed up, it's like, look, this is not an easy role, but it's a very rewarding one. So I'm welcoming the bitter as much as I can. So those things just stick out to me for some reason. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So what advice do you have for people looking to connect with either of these traditions, um, specifically mm-hmm. a calm because there just hasn't been anyone to speak on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I will first say follow our page and I give a lot of, we give a lot of information about Akan culture um, through Proverbs. Um, if you have questions, you can reach out. Um, but there also are books that you can read as well. Is one by a man named Kwame Chichi. Um, G- the last name is G-Y-E-K-Y-E. Kwame, K-W-A-M-E. So that book is called, I think it's African Philosophical Thought. Um, and that one goes through like the foundational stuff of Akan everything. Talks about what it means to be a person in that, in that you know, cultural system. Um, and there are some other books as well. 
Um, the names are slipping my head right now, but I can get them to you okay. um, and you can add them in the comment section um, so that people can find them. But the, the the books, I think when you read that, it'll begin to help you understand, okay, what is this? Um, and in, in a DC area, there's different shrine houses. Right now with COVID, a lot of stuff isn't happening, um, but there are some different temples that you know, are, are more, a lot, very welcoming to having people come in and engage and so on. So definitely follow us and reach out and we can help as we can. Okay. Um, I think I would add something that's a little bit less practical, but it's still practical. But I think that whatever tradition you're trying to get into, whether it's Ifa, uh, kind of like there's certain things that you can start with, you know, like, like, like you can start with connecting, developing a strong connection to your ancestors. Like, you know, it's it's one of the first things I started doing was uh, just creating a space where I had a lot of pictures and stuff, objects and everything related to my ancestors. Very important to me. It's, even though I have a lot of shrines, it's something I still go to, you know, pouring libation. You know, we, 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 we're we working. We may have something coming up um, to help people with libation, but just some basic rituals like that to, to strengthen my connection with my ancestors have been extremely helpful because I know sometimes it's difficult. Sometimes it's difficult to want to connect to something, but not always have a clear path. Sometimes it's like you, your ancestors will guide you. You're doing the work of your ancestors. Yeah. I say this all the time. This These traditions have been attempted to be stripped away from us. So as, you, as you're returning back and coming full circle, the ancestors are behind you. They support you, you know, and you're doing this work also. So their future generations, right. you know, like, like we're saying, like, you know, we came up in this, but it's because of the work my father did, you know, so your future generations will appreciate you. So know that you got people in front of you and behind you. And the last thing I would say, specific to the Ifa tradition, is just your Ori. You know, like before you connect with any other Orisha, anybody else, you can connect with your Ori, mm -hmm. get right with yourself, be introspective, you know, just hold your head and pray for your own destiny, you know, um, your own spirit. So, yeah. yeah. I, I was just on live before I interviewed y'all, and that's exactly what I was talking about with Rio's testimony. Uh, yep. Yeah. Yeah. That's it right there. Um, all through the plug. But, okay, I appreciate y'all. Can y'all drop your ads? What links? Do you got sites? How do people yeah. find you? And then also, do you all do, like, readings or do you connect do you do any nah. type of mentorship anything like that not yet not okay. yet still still studying still learning you know maybe, maybe in a few years i'll do public uh public work and stuff like that yeah, yeah. i mean but you if you have questions about stuff you can yeah, reach out absolutely and ask us questions and we'll help and if we can try to push you to to someone else who may be able to you know give yeah you readings and that's so true on. that's true okay. um, so yeah but you can follow me at ori ray uh, o R I I R E. Mm -hmm. You can follow our proverb page at Words from Yesterday. Just straight up. Um, what's my page? It's a uh, K W A K U dot B E K O E. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Okay. Cool. That will all be in the show notes for y'all watching and listening to be easily accept acceptable. Um, I'm so thankful to y'all. Like, this was so good. Same here. Yeah. For the wisdom and the proverbs and the words. Um, it was very meaningful to me. So I appreciate y'all. Thank, thank you for having us. Yeah. I mean, we, we, we appreciate the work that you're doing. Um, I think that, uh, you know, we have a responsibility to uplift the tradition. I, th I think you're doing that work, you know, giving people credible information because there's a lot of misinformation out there. So I, I love that you're with your own personal knowledge, you're sharing. I love that you're also having people on here who can share credible information. So, you know, I hope that this continues to go really far. I share. Thank you. I see that. And listen, y'all done put y'all ads out. Y'all said people can reach out. I'm trying to tell you, people going to reach out. So you did, did that. You done put out in the world. It's a lot of listeners. So just watch the DMs. <laughs> All right, y'all. Right, thank you so much. Have a beautiful day. I appreciate you. All right. You too. Take care. Can't firm no say, no say, and I'll never, never keep playing.